Thank you very much. Um, one of the great disadvantages of becoming old is that your memory goes. So um, I can't remember stuff that I looked at a couple of hours ago, so I'm going to have to use my notes if you forgive me. The other big um, disadvantage of getting old is a couple of months ago I had to have my eyes operated on for cataracts. So now for the very first time in my life, I can see everybody clearly at a distance, but I can't see what's in front of me without my glasses. So I'm joining the rest of the, my age group uh, with my reading glasses perched on the end of my nose. I can't tell you yet. Anyway. Okay, here we go. Uh, we're going to be talking about proteins. We obviously have to have proteins in our diet. It's an essential source. We can't manufacture um, uh, nitrogen uh, ourselves. So we have to have a source, and that source is, is dietary protein. And I'm going to go fairly quickly because there's a huge amount of material. I could stand here all day and talk about proteins. And uh, Neil knows I can do it too. <laughs> um, in a global context, um, we're going to have to produce a huge amount of food in the next 40 years with the, the population statistics that everybody's keep coming out with. Um, <clears throat> if people want to eat more animal protein, then basically um, we're going to have to produce about three times more calories uh, in energy and food than we're doing right now. Um, the International Energy Association are estimating that in 2030, these are the kind of numbers I can't remember, we'll need to generate 50% more energy than we produce today. And the FAO uh, is saying that we need to produce 50% more food than we harvest today. And as for water, um, the, the challenge is, is equally demanding. Um, this is a slide which is <coughs> very familiar to me as an ex uh, Soleil employee. Um, but basically, the point it's making is you need huge amounts of land uh, to produce even a small quantity of animal protein. You've got to feed all that vegetable protein through an animal to produce animal protein, and it's tremendously inefficient. Um, conversion of uh, protein feeding cattle uh, is about 5 to 10 percent, in sheep, it's about 10 to 15 percent. And we can't feed the world with animal protein. We will not be able to do it. It's completely unsustainable. Um, so basically, perhaps very, very rich people, and I mean far richer perhaps than even we are now, will be able to afford to produce uh, uh, animal protein at the right-hand side of that graph. And the rest of us will be, will be consuming vegetable protein. What kind of form will that take? Well, we've got some clues already. Um, we have the, the current crop of animal proteins, we have the vegetable proteins, uh, the cereals, the legumes, the tubers, like potatoes, for example, the oil seeds, um, and we have then the microalgae and uh, the possibility of producing food from microorganisms. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those um, as, we, as we go through the presentation. So, one thing I haven't spoken about yet is uh, and it's very uh, important in the context of switching from a mainly animal protein uh, diet to a vegetable protein diet is protein quality, nutritional quality of, 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 the, of the protein. So most people still agree that the protein digestibility correctly, the myomycetes score, is the best method for determining protein quality because it basically depends on human <coughs> myomycetes requirements and not rat myomycetes requirements or any other experimental animal. Uh, it's recommended by the reg for regulatory purposes by the uh, uh, international organizations, including uh, the FAO, the WHO. And as I say, it's based on human myomycetes requirements. And not only that, but that group of humans in our population who have the most uh, highest demand in terms of essential myomycetes have a uh, one to two year old child. Another thing um, I wanted to show you, and this is my COVID. lost a graph. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to show you was actually was, was this, and we'll have it when you, when you get the actual um, stick, memory stick. But basically what this, what this shows you is that the recommendations of FAO and WHO, the first one was in 1987, where the first idea of PDCAAS came from. Uh, and then it was repeated in 2002. And what's changed in these essential myomycetes requirements is Quite surprisingly, because the uh, branch chain amino acids, isoleucine, leucine, and valine, have really jumped. And the rest have changed to some extent. Sulfur amino acids haven't changed at all uh, in terms of estimations of the So 
one of the reasons that the Brownstein mine assets have jumped so much is because between 1987 and 2002, uh, there was the beginning of the realization, even further developed now, um, that the branch chain mine assets play a very, very important role in protein synthesis. In fact, leucine is the trigger in muscle tissue, which starts off the, the signaling sequence, which leads to muscles, uh, uh, muscle protein synthesis. So that's absolutely vital, and we're beginning to understand that now. So if you haven't got enough leucine in your diet, particularly, you won't be producing, you won't be producing muscle protein uh, at, at, at the optimum rate. <clears throat> and, I, and I can't remember <laughs> what, what, the, what the recommendation is for leucine. Uh, I suppose it's on here. Uh, you need to be consuming um, 39 milligrams per kilogram per day of leucine. So you need to look at your protein sources and find out, look at your minority composition and find out if you're, if you're consuming that much. Now I'm going to start talking about, I'm going to here, you want to excuse me. Uh, I'm going to start talking about individual proteins. Uh, dairy proteins are generally recognized to be among the best quality proteins from a nutritional perspective, and of course it's true. If we take liquid milk, I mean liquid milk has this array, and in fact I've, I've missed out some of them because you have things like down the bottom there, very low concentrations of things like lactoferrin and, and lactoperoxidase. But basically you have two major types of, of proteins. But if in liquid milk, you've not only got all that, you've got all the calcium and all the phosphorus as well. So, <sighs> tremendous. Oh, I should have put in a protein composition of cow's milk uh, on that slide. I'm talking about cow's milk here. So we've got 33 grams per liter of total protein, 26 of which is casein proteins, and um, <clears throat> 6.3 grams per liter of uh, so-called whey proteins. But the whey proteins are a very complex um, <clears throat> number of components. Uh, the casein's less so, um, but basically that's what you get when you're, when you're consuming uh, uh, dairy protein. So the dairy proteins we just said split into the caseins, the caseins form the cheese curd, the structure of the cheese curd, and apart from making cheese, the, the next biggest use for the casein is as caseinate, where you precipitate out of skim milk the caseins, and the whey proteins are what we're left behind. They don't precipitate at a pH form. Um, and whey protein, um, whey in the past was, when I started in the dairy industry, um, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, but a long time ago, uh, the, the company that I worked for at that time uh, was producing acid casein, acid casein to convert to caseinate. And the acid casein was a real problem. It was, it was waste. It was dumped in the local river until the local authority said, no, 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 you can't do that. Um, the company got involved with piggeries, basically, so we could feed uh, acid casein away to pigs. That was one of the only things we could do with it. Um, and then the company got involved with making bacon and pork and God knows what else. Uh, very complicated. But it was a real problem. It was a real headache. And it wasn't until really the technology advanced uh, with ultrafiltration membranes and ion exchange resins that we were able to pick out the various components from the way and add value to them. Uh, I still remember the first um, membranes we used, ultrafiltration membranes, were so crude that about the maximum concentration we could get to in terms of protein was about 35%, which coincidentally is about the same protein concentration that you find in the of powder. So we were producing 35% uh, whey protein concentrates to compete with the skin milk powder, which we were also producing. Anyway. As technology advanced, the ability to get to higher and higher and higher concentrations meant that we could get to 80 and then eventually 90%, but at tremendous cost. So how were you going to sell these things? The, the, the position these things in the market such that you can recuperate that tremendously high manufacturing uh, cost. And one of the biggest um, users of uh, whey proteins now is in sports nutrition. And basically what the dairy industry have done over the past 30 or 40 years is call on that market. So basically if you ask uh, a bodybuilder what's the best sort of protein for, for you to use if you, if you want to build muscle mass, whey protein. And look on the internet how much there is out there of whey protein. That market is completely dominated by whey protein. And the, the prices that are being asked for, I went uh, 
to buy just out of interest a new product that had been launched on the market by Holland and Barrett. And I bought two one kilo pots of, of protein, pretty much pure protein, 85% protein, I think it was, with some flavor and maybe it was a color. How much did I pay for two kilo pots of protein? 50. 50. Guesses? 50. 50. 60 pounds. 60 pounds, 30 pounds a kilo of protein. Impressive. Right. Um, Oh, that was just to say, um, the bottom picture there is a development by CSIRO in Canada, in Australia, I beg your pardon, um, which is a continuous line exchange chromatography uh, set of equipment. Basically, it's on a carousel, and it operates continuously so that you don't have the, uh, when I started, you had the old cycle of uh, uh, adds all the protein onto the resin, wash the resin, desorb the protein from the resin, and then, and then, and then starts all over again. <coughs> this, this is, this is continuous. So basically, this is a very efficient way. And there, there are companies now uh, around the dairy companies using this kind of equipment. Shows you how technology changes uh, over time and makes other things possible. Uh, yeah, I don't know why I bought the uh, this thing on the, on the thing. But basically, you've got whey protein concentrates in excess of a billion dollars, a billion US dollars. In the world. So it goes to show you how, in a very short space or relatively short space of time, something which is a real problem has become a real money step. So, uh, yeah, uh, the, the usual suspects in terms of uh, dairy protein, we all know where dairy protein is used and where we find them. Um, and, uh, yeah, there is this interesting thing here. Casein, well, casein not so much whey protein, particularly casein protein. Uh, 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 rich sources of bioactive peptides, which have a, different, a number of different uh, uh, a number of different effects, which have been demonstrated in the literature. This isn't just wild uh, dairy industry claims. Uh, reduce blood pressure, induce satiety. Uh, I don't know that last one. This is just <coughs> egg protein. Um, egg, pro egg white is is sold uh, dried. Mainly as a function of ingredients. It's not really sold as a nutritional ingredient or a source of protein nutrition. But eggs are, obviously, in the diet of everybody. Um, and we can fractionate them. We can take out uh, some proteins, specialized proteins like lysosomes, for example, which have unique uh, antimicrobial effects. Uh, and that's quite interesting. And again, uh, just for your future reference, that gives you uh, some of the information about the composition of, of, of eggs and egg protein. Uh, soy protein, um, well, <laughs> this is where I came in, isn't it? Um, but there is some dispute about that 2,000 year uh, number up there, 2,000 years of consumption. Some people say it's much more. Um, but certainly, uh, soybeans, processed soybeans, or soybeans unprocessed, uh, mainly edamame is hardly processed at all, uh, have been consumed for a very long time in the forest, and still continue to. It's a very high quality protein in terms of its nutritional profile, its amino acid profile. It's comparable in quality to normal based proteins. It's one of the few, more than two actually, that I know, and I'll talk about the other one in a minute. Uh, contains, uh, it's rich in lysine, um, and it's a very economic source of protein because basically it's being used directly for uh, human consumption. There's no uh, animal uh, uh, in the way. <coughs> now, um, I, I like to tell a little anecdote. When I joined uh, the soy protein business um, a long time ago, again, uh, I remember uh, I just left the dairy industry to join the soy protein industry, and I went to one of our application centres there, which was in uh, just north of London in St Albans, and uh, the US people had sent over some new isolated soy protein, which was wonderful for direct consumption and drinks. I was in the applications of Roger and we were mixing up this stuff and tasting it. I remember the first time I tasted it, I said to myself, oh my God, what have I done? It was bad. It really was. 30 years ago, it was bad. But 30 years of continuous improvement, um, I could show you products now which you wouldn't have any objection to at all from the point of view of flavor. So that has opened up a huge uh, range of, of applications in the food business 
and many more people now are formulating and so person than, than we're doing 20, 30 years ago. I used a huge uh, variety of applications, that's where I got my funding uh, for a lot of the time, manufacturing some of these uh, uh, wide range of products uh, with so proteins. Pea protein is very, very interesting. Now, my personal uh, information about pea protein is a few years old, and when I first tried it and compared it side by side with soy protein and milk proteins, I didn't like it very much. It had a very, very legume pea-like flavor. I understand from people who've been working with it since then that it's much improved, just in the same way as soy protein flavor is improved. Um, but basically, the particular interest of pea protein, or one particular interest, is it's not on any EU or US allergen label list. So you can put it in your product, you're not getting it. It's not to say it's not allergenic. All proteins are allergenic or potential allergens. It's just that you don't have to declare it. Okay? As an allergy. Um, the protein rich cereal seeds. Everybody says you can't uh, use, uh, and this is another bone of contention in mind. People start thinking about using single sources of protein. Um, I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. But basically, if you look at the, uh, the cereals, they tend to be rich in lysine but low in sulfur amino acids. So you couldn't really use them as a single source. But that's not how they're used in uh, many, many traditional societies. Um, I remember years ago, uh, in my what they now call popularly uh, gap year, I went to uh, teach in Jamaica. And one of the traditional dishes in Jamaica was rice and peas, where you've got, uh, <coughs> you've got a, a cereal which is deficient in uh, in lysine, uh, and you've got peas, a legume, which are rich in lysine, but themselves deficient in salt amino acids, or not deficient, but lower in salt amino acids. So that combination is actually the first class quality nutritional protein source. But we will carry on working and uh, getting higher yielding varieties and nutritional superior grades and, and so on and so forth. That's undoubted. Uh, minor seed opportunities, quinoa. I remember when quinoa hit Europe uh, again many years ago. Everybody got terribly excited about it. Uh, it never really came to anything, did it? I, I really haven't heard of quinoa being exploited in any kind of uh, quantity. It's got good nutrition proteins and it's high in lysine. Um, Vampire ground nut. Uh, lupin. Again, I was involved in a lupin uh, manufacturing project in the old Soviet Union uh, many years ago. And the problem with, with, with that was it just fell apart when the good old Soviet Union fell apart. But nothing to say that you can't extract good quality protein from them. Um, brewing. Um, basically, 100,000 tons of protein um, in uh, basically food waste from brewing in this country, in the UK. Now, uh, there's the composition. Uh, of, of, of this material here, 24% protein. It's also extracted, easily extracted. Now, um, potato is the fourth largest produced crop in the world. We produce uh, 4.5 million tons of potatoes. 1.5% is a bit low, actually, it's actually probably closer to 2%, but let's, up, let's underestimate rather than overestimate. Let me look and see if I'm missing any important numbers here. Just talking to yourselves for a minute. Um, yeah. Uh, China produces about 15 times the number of potatoes, the quantity of potatoes that, that we produce. Russia, about 10 times. Uh, so they're number one and number two. We're not even in the top 10 with our four and a half. Uh, four and a half million tons, but at 1.5% uh, <coughs> protein, 60, I'm not reading that right, 67,500 tons. It's huge, just from protein. Now, okay, you're going to say, well, you can't process all of those uh, potatoes into starch and protein because we eat some of them directly, fair enough. But supposing you take a tiny fraction, the tiny fraction that's processed into starch, there's still a lot of protein to be extracted, and one of the big um, Dutch uh, potato starch producers, the biggest in the world, Avibi, is actually selling uh, potato protein. 
it's very, very good. It's very soluble, it's very functional, and it has a very, very high nutritional profile. The amino acid profile of potato protein is the best in the vegetable kingdom, as far as we're concerned. So number one will be potato, number two will be soy. And I bet not many people knew that. Um, it became grass in 2012, but that's not relevant for us because it's been approved in Europe for many, many years. And it's beginning to be, to be sold. It's beginning to show itself on the protein market in Europe. Um, microprotein core, um, developed by RHM, uh, many years ago, um, uh, as a meat substitute, something to substitute the meat in the center of the plate. Uh, it's very good. Um, it, was, it was developed to use starchy wastes that our HM's company were producing at that time. Uh, fermentation with a mold, fusarium, uh, glucose starch as the feed, uh, mild flavor, low in fat, uh, good quality protein, and, and again, it's been around for a long time. I don't know if it's of significance that it's broadly accepted in the vegetarian community. Is it because uh, we consume fungal species, other fungal species like mushrooms, and we've accepted them for a, a, a long time? But is there a place for more products um, like corn, not necessarily corn, but like corn, uh, which could, could extend our uh, use of waste materials and improve our protein supply in the diet. Um, these are hydrophobins are interesting because not interesting from a nutritional point of view so much as from a functional point of view. They are very, very, very efficient emulsifying proteins. Uh, in Europe, uh, we have, for better or for worse, we have an aversion to CNE numbers on our, on our products. And this would be a very good way to avoid chemical emulsifiers and use this, these kind of proteins as, as emulsifiers, eliminate the uh, emulsifier E numbers from the products. How am I doing for time? Five. Okay. I'll start gab gabbling a bit more then. Uh, algae, as pro this is great. I mean, basically, because this solves a lot of problems all in one go. Produce high quality protein from algae, uses carbon dioxide instead of producing it, um, requires very little water uh, to grow. Can be, can be grown on land which can't be used for anything else. So, you know, this, this is really interesting. This is something which could be very, very good. At the moment, it's only used for animal feed, mainly poultry. But if this process can be improved, and if the product, the end product can be improved, there's no reason at all why that could be a direct protein source for human consumption. Um, again, I just throw this in, in for interest. Um, cold tolerance organisms like Antarctic fish produce proteins in their plasma, which stop them from freezing uh, in the extremely cold conditions that we find down there. Um, Unilever are now using these, uh, these uh, proteins in ice cream because it structures the, it structures the ice in the protein uh, and makes the product smoother, uh, smooth mouth feel creamy, creamier, and uh, long shelf life in frozen foods. You know how ice cream becomes very crystalline if you keep it in the bottom of your freezer for too long. This would, this would increase the shelf life of these products. Um, again, just for interest, a uh, lot of uh, sweet proteins uh, becoming known now, uh, <coughs> sugar replacers as chemical uh, sweetener replacers too, uh, some of them 3,000 times sweeter than sugar. Uh, no demand for insulin, so you, you basically have a diabetic friendly uh, sweetener. Uh, but we, just, we, we really still don't really know how they work. Uh, and this is all about protein modification. And again, protein modification has been around for a long time. Uh, obviously, hydrolysis, breaking down into, into short peptide chains um, for functional reasons. And we, again, we've been doing that for, we've been doing that with soy proteins for as long as I've been around. Um, uh, but things like uh, transglutaminates, cross-linking proteins, cross-linking peptides, also interesting. And again, some of these products, some of these innovative uh, modified proteins are beginning to come onto the market. Leaf proteins, um, this, is, this is the major um, enzyme which is used for uh, basically photosynthesis. 
uh, I can't tell you, I can't remember what the, uh, what the, uh, what the uh, abbreviation stands for. Um, I've got it written down, but I haven't got time to find it. Uh, most abundant source of protein in the world, of course. Um, if we could find a way economically to extract those proteins more efficiently, um, then I think this, this could be significant. We obviously can't eat leaves, we can't do eat salads, but we can't, we can't extract the protein uh, in any kind of efficient way from, uh, from leaves currently. Uh, but if we could do it uh, industrially, and it has, it's, again, it's not new. Um, the, the alfalfa, for example, in the US was grown for protein extraction for animal feed. Um, and that was done, I think, just after the Second World War. So there's nothing tremendously new about this concept, just that nobody has really been pressured uh, economically to go and do it on a big scale. Uh, single cell protein, uh, everybody remembers the disastrous uh, ICI experience after, in the 1960s, uh, where they built huge plants um, to, uh, to grow, uh, to produce uh, protein from uh, uh, bacteria uh, in the Northeast. Uh, big failure. Now, can that be improved? Have we got better technology? Yeah, we certainly have. Krill, um, we hear a lot about krill. My concern is that we're already expressing concerns of sustainability because it's currently been exploited as a source of omega-3 rich uh, phospholipids. But if we're doing that, we could take the waste from that process and extract the protein from it, or take that out of the, uh, out of the ocean. Um, insects. Um, again, my attitude towards eating insects is we show no repugnance to consuming marine arthropods in Europe. Crabs, lobsters, shrimp. Why should the consumption of terrestrial ones seem so odd? I think I'm nearly finished. Oh yeah, the R factor. Will consumers accept eating nice, cuddly uh, species that we don't currently use for meat? Um, you know, uh, my wife uh, wouldn't, wouldn't eat lamb once she'd seen little lambs gambling around in the field, so <laughs> what chance have we got for anything else? Uh, wool, feathers, that's about it. David, thank you. Any question for David, please? Yes, sir. I, yes, pro sir. I promised to ask you a question on hydration, so here it is. <laughs> it's not the way you think it's going to be. You mentioned on one of your first slides about the need to produce 50% more food or calories or protein and 30% more water access to water for the next 30 years. 40 years. Between now and 2050. You've also presented to us a huge form of protein sources. Mm -hmm. Do you see a pressure, or do you hear a pressure that if we get it wrong now, then there could be a conflict in terms of our, an open warfare for access to protein and water? That's what I well, think. certainly water. I mean, water's already been spoken about as being the next oil and the cause of, of, of conflict. Um, protein, well, protein is a consequence, production of protein is a consequence of having access to water. So if you cut off, cut off somebody's water supply, then you cut off their uh, capability to produce protein, either vegetable or animal protein. So yeah, I can see that. I can so see is, that. There, is there a tipping point? Do you see that you know, in terms of the tipping point of in climate? I don't know where that is. Like, there point probably point is, but I'm not, I don't have access to the data to be able to say what that is. I don't know. One last question, Doug. Um, as far as I know, to uh, isolate uh, hydrophobin is quite difficult. Is there any progress you're aware of in terms of uh, ways to extract hydrophobins more efficiently? The only way I'd be able to uh, answer that question correctly, because I, I really am not an expert, would be to go back and read the notes uh, and, and, and do that. But have a look in the, in the notes. When you get the presentation on the stick, there, there are quite extensive uh, presentation notes in there I think you'll find the answer to your question in the answer. Sorry. Great last question. Just out of interest, how healthy is it for you to take any protein or something that's compared to actually using uh, how, In the context of what? In the context of bodybuilders? In the context of just a straightforward diet. Well, I mean, um, dietary amino acids are deanidated pretty quickly if you don't use them. If they're not incorporated into protein, they're deanidated <coughs> and the carbohydrate uh, skeleton is just burnt, burnt up as, as energy like any other carbohydrate source would be. Huh? You're kind of burning money. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and and, the, and then they, well, that's what bodybuilders do. 
I think, you know, I used to say they're pissing away their money because the, nit the nitrogen part of, the, of much of the protein that they're buying is excreted in urine. Um, so, how healthy is it? Well, your body has mechanisms to get rid of excess protein. So if you are, are over-consuming protein, as many of these body builders are, um, and they probably need no more than about, I mean, the typical recommendation is about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body mass per day. And they're probably consuming anywhere between 1.2 and 1.5. But that excess isn't going there, it's going to the toilet. So it's not, not a danger just, as you say, a waste of money. That's a good Thanks for the rest of the video.